Okay, good. Well, um, I was going to introduce myself, but I may not need to. I'm Mary Sanderson, but I'm speaking this morning um, as a member of the Social Justice Committee of, Met of Bloor Street uh, United Church and um, want to welcome um, on behalf of both Bloor Street and, Met and, and uh, St. Matthews, everybody who is with us today. And I want to remind you all that last Monday, October the 17th, was the United Nations International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. And what better way for us to honor that day than by talking about guaranteed livable income or basic income. If we had that, there would not be any poverty. And so, that's what our subject is today. And we have two very knowledgeable and illustrious women who are going to bring slightly different perspectives. Sheila Regeer is one of the founding members of Basic Income Canada. And Sheila, what an honor it is for us to have you. Basic Income Canada is um, a secular cross-country network of experienced basic income advocates that work with our provincial um, groups to implement our common goal, which is a nationwide basic guaranteed income um, so to ensure that everyone can meet basic needs and live with dignity without poverty. And um, Sheila, I'm, we're just so fortunate to have you involved in this. Sheila brings a wealth of background in human rights activities. And um, Sheila, I'm part of the national, uh, the, the United Church's National Committee and very aware of what basic income has accomplished, but which you personally have accomplished. And on behalf of all of us here and in the country, I want to say thank you for your commitment to this. I know it's a long haul, but please don't give up. <laughs> We've got to get there. Um, after we hear from Sheila, uh, we're going to hear from our own Lois Wilson. And Lois chairs the National United Church um, Committee on Guaranteed Livable Income. And they we meet once a month. And the basic um, goal is to educate members of the United Church congregation to, um, to work towards GLI. And Lois is the liaison between basic income and the, the United Churches Committee. So it's very helpful that you're here, Lois, and we'll get a slightly different perspective from you. So the format will be that we'll hear now in a minute from Sheila, and then we'll hear from Lois and then open it up for questions. So I um, hope everybody will hang in there. And again, Sheila, thank you for being here and all you're doing, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I also wanna say, uh, unfortunately not here, but thanks to Lori Monsabratton too, who hatched up this idea and gave me some hints of things to say. So I've, you know, based what I'm gonna say on, on part of our discussion. Um, I also want to acknowledge just the tremendous work that the United Church has done on this issue for decades and, and Lois Wilson in particular, um, and highlight that it is so very important that we're talking about this issue on around the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. Um, in my <laughs> bio is long, basically I'm a policy wonk. Like, I'm not a public speaker, uh, whatever, but here I am. So I just want to say like how much this policy need keeps growing and growing and how much it really shouldn't be this way. And it's going to take a lot of us to make things better. So that's a lot of what I want to talk about today is the issue of a lot of us. So I want to talk just a little bit, first of all, I don't want to bore anybody too much about my own organization, but I want to talk a little bit about the history of movement building in Canada on this issue. So Lois goes back a ways, I go back a ways in some of this stuff too, but it was around 2008 that the Basic Income Canada Network was formed. And as Mary said, it was formed 
by people in from different walks of life. There were politicians, there were policy people, there were academics, there were grassroots activists. So that's how we started. A lot of the people who came to the group at that point and continue to do so come from anti-poverty organizations. So those early years in the earlier 2000s were really tough, but we kept building, we kept building. We got to the point where, where Canada was a sort of recognized international force and we hosted the Basic Income International Congress in Montreal in 2014. So I became chair at that point and I could spend the whole rest of my time here talking about the amazing people I've been working with um, here and around the world. It's, it's just phenomenal how this has grown. Um, but I also wanna, again, give special thanks, I think, to Lori and others in the media. One of the biggest accomplishments that I think BICN did in the early years um, is work with media to be able to kind of influencing the messaging that the media and therefore public and politicians um, started having around basic income, that it wasn't some loony out there idea that we could talk about this sensibly. It was a policy issue and we could do this. Then in 2015, there was quite a pivotal change, a new government federally, um, new hope, lots of new regional and local basic income group, groups sprung up, more and more allies came forward. Kathleen Wynne that year was quietly in the background developing her idea for the Ontario pilot. The ICN in the background was developing its ideas for what a national policy would look like. And that still sets the benchmarks basically for the, the kind of policy we're looking for. And then in the last in-person co conference we held in Canada was in 2018, the North American conference in Hamilton, which included basic income pilot participants. And I can't stress to you how much the voices of those people who were part of this pilot influence the, the discourse around the world and the way we approach basic income. So that was huge. But then of course, by 2020, the pilot had been canceled. Our policy options were released. Um, I think the day before the first COVID case was identified in Canada. So then we had COVID. But we also have at this point new political champions, a lot of activity going on. And then there was CERB and CERB became a thing beyond what Canada identified or called its Canada Emergency Response Benefit. It's not a basic income, but that direct cash benefits delivered fast with fewer conditions became the world's go-to for responding to the pandemic's economic needs. So it was as much a global response as masking and vaccines. We hoped it would be the thing that would actually push us over the edge in Canada to get a basic income. Alas, not yet, but we're still working for it. So while the movement has grown um, and there's incredible ally building, the ICN is still the only national registered nonprofit and it's a struggle. Um, we have applied for charitable status, which is interesting. Part of our work involves like working with allies like the United Church, like academic institutions who do have charitable status. For us, it's difficult because in Canada, despite the fact that we've signed on so this international day and goal of the eradication of poverty, Canada's charitable status is granted to people who want to alleviate poverty. And it's hard to get charitable status without that. So in Canada, we should call this maybe the international day of creating more food banks and homeless shelters and emergency hospital beds and programs to reduce gun violence and improve mental health we're not set up to eradicate poverty. And that's what we really need to do. Um, we bear enormous human and financial costs for, for the failed policy decisions that our governments have made. So let me talk now about, you know, basically what's a basic income. I know most of you know this. 
and where are we now? So Lori asked me to start with a little, um, just comment on nomenclature, which we call the alphabet soup of basic income. So there's G, I'm not even gonna tell you what the words are. There's GLBI, UBI, NIT, GBI, GAI, many, many more. Um, there's even now internationally EBI, which is called emergency basic income, which is an oxymoron. Um, from my perspective, like actually trying to get policy change, it doesn't matter what you call it, it matters what it does. So for BICN, and I think for most others in Canada, we have three really big goals for a basic income. We wanna prevent poverty, no sense waiting for it to happen. We wanna reduce inequality, and that's where we get at how we pay for this through tax fairness and create a better society overall and improve security. And that's where you get into design issues of what the reduction rate looks like, who gets it and, and how much. So what makes something a basic income is that it is unconditional. It's not tied to um, employment or behavioral requirements. It's universal, and there's an international debate around this. In Canada, universal means universal the way healthcare is universal. You don't get heart surgery if you don't need it. You get a basic income when your circumstances are such that you need it. But it is accessible to everyone. Um, it is individual and it's adequate. And Canada has always stressed the adequacy of basic income more than a lot of the international partners and some of the original more philosophical writings around basic income. Adequacy really, really matters to us. And that's where the connection to, to poverty and insecurity comes in. As I said, we want it to gradually rot, the benefit to gradually reduce as other income increases. This is the security part of it. This is the stability. This means you're not on or off this system. It means well up into the middle income brackets, you're going to get something and you know that, that you can rely on that. Again, for us in Canada, what's really important is that it works in synergy with other supports and services that are beyond the basics. So this is you know, generally healthcare, education, those kinds of large public services, as well as specific needs, for example, people with disabilities. Um, let me say just a couple of words now about CERB, um, because I think they're, like I said, we, we hope that this would be the thing that would help everybody understand that we really need something like this. But there are a lot of lessons from CERB, both, you know, things that did really well and some of the flaws. So one of the key things I think is that we've identified, generally I think it's accepted by the Canadian population now, that about $2,000 is a reasonable amount of money to meet basic needs. Not the 700 and change that Ontario Works recipients get in this province. Um, interestingly enough, it's also the amount that the Basic Income Canada Network modeled in its options, in all of its options. Um, the other thing that we learned from CERB is that temporary programs that change rules frequently don't really provide much security and stability. So that was one of the problems with CERB and some of the things that got the federal government bad press is, you know, people complained afterwards, but it was confusing for everybody and it was a pandemic and we had to do things faster than we really wanted to. Um, so that's understandable and it's fixable. The biggest problem was that the people who needed it the most didn't qualify because the rules around it were related to employment. It had an extreme built-in employment disincentive, which is really ironic given how much government people seem to, and economists, some of them, seem to worry about this work disincentive idea, which has never been documented. But despite its flaws, like it has done a remarkable job of delivering fast. It shows the capacity that this government has. It showed that we can exceed the targets we've already got for poverty reduction. Like we know how to do this. So then 
what what we do like we've we've also got so much more that goes into this we've got the experience from the ontario pilot to add to what we know from serb we've got a lot of provinces involved now prince edward island newfoundland and labrador northwest territories meeting around that this afternoon um the atlantic is getting quite politically active as a region we've got the um na new national advisory council on poverty really on board now we've got discussions going at the all-party anti-poverty caucus on the hill um the, the, the allies come from food security from public health from ceos like it's really widespread so this is Lori's question then that I'm to answer. Well, try. So if a basic income is so promising, why don't we have one? And this is gonna lead into my last section and then I'll stop talking and you know we can talk about what interests you. Um, so I have six, six reasons on you know, why, why we don't have one. I think the number one is prejudice, discrimination, inequality and power. This idea, it's just so hard to fight this idea that somehow people in poverty must have caused it themselves. They must be lazy. There must be people out there taking advantage. Um, closely linked to this is what John Abbott, who's a social services minister in Newfoundland and Labrador describes as the policy by exception approach. So this means that if a bunch of usually federal public servants, so I used to work for the federal government for years and years, sit around trying to design a policy. The first thing they come up with is who's, who's going to be able to cheat the system? Like who's going to be able to take advantage? And if there's anybody who might take advantage, then they just go, well, we can't do this. Even though 98, 90%, 98, 99% of the population are going to enormously benefit from this, if there's if there's a little wrinkle in there that suggests that you know somebody might squeeze through a gap then it's off the table um hugh siegel also talks about this and he, he talks about the protectionism of the finance department federally in particular um wanting to keep control of the money rather than putting it in the hands of citizens and residents um the third one is path dependency so the World Bank report that talks about how all of these countries developed Serb-like measures, all of those countries were also very quick to turn them off as soon as the worst of the pandemic seemed to be over and go back to the way we used to do things. So that path dependency, we've always done things this way so we can tinker with this and fix a few things, not going to work. The fourth one is what Lori has described as we were talking as the unicorn fallacy. So basic income is usually set up by people who set up a straw man. So they create this perfect thing, this mythical unicorn creature, and they say that basic income fails because it doesn't do everything. And our response is it's not a unicorn. It's not supposed to be a unicorn. That's not what we want. We need a workhorse. It fails as a unicorn, it really succeeds as a workhorse. And we need this because nothing that we've got now is good enough to be up to the task that we're facing. Um, as, as somebody on living on low income told the National Advisory Council on Poverty, poverty isn't only about income, but it is always about income. So this is the bedrock of creating the capacity in the space for so much other change. Number five on my list is, and I faced this with a right-wing economist on a radio show recently, it's not the right time. If times are good, then yeah, we don't need it. Let's not talk about this. And if times are bad, it's like, we can't possibly afford this. And this is the general, you know, traditional economic approach to this. There's never a good time which means the time is right now. Um, and then the last one, and there's, there was a lot of talk about this amongst politicians uh, recently at a meeting, is the failure to take account of how much the current system costs us. So there's a preoccupation with the theoretical cost, usually the gross cost of a basic income, 
but not very much on the enormous costs that we're paying out now and the fact that it's not fixing anything, that our problems are getting worse. So I'll finish then with a short list and I'll go through it quickly of what we can do. So this comes from lots of people, from Nate Erskine Smith, especially and most recently, that we need to be in the basic income movement coordinated loud, not antagonistic and not aggressive, but loud. And I seem to be talking about animals a lot in this little thing. I often use football analogies, but you know, we did the unicorn and the horse thing. My recent sort of experience with this in my neighborhood is we've got coyotes moving in. They're occupying human space and we're letting them. So as a neighborhood, like they're, they're sleeping in kids' parks in this very urban neighborhood. And we all just kind of let them do that and walk away. And so we're developing a plan to like, when you see them, you puff up your jacket, you bring out a whistle, you bang something, you make noise. You let them know that this is our territory and you have to respect that. So the basic income movement needs to be that, it needs to occupy that space for the people who really need help. Um, very quickly, go to the BICN website and sign on as a supporter, numbers count, the federal government cares who supports this. You don't ever have to hear from us again if you don't want to, but the numbers matter. Um, but you can sign up for newsletters and lots of other great things that are on the website. Lots of really good news that comes in all the time. Keep building allies. Keep focusing on the media. They're under-resourced and understaffed. If we give them stories and op-eds and articles and blogs and help them, we'll get our message out there. Meetings like this. Um, Anything political, write and visit your local councillor, your mayor, your MPP, your MP with the same message. Whichever order of government it is, the feds need to engage and they need to engage with all orders of governments because we have to fix this together. Um, advocate with other organizations that you're part of. We all have multiple networks and allies. So all of those different affiliations can really help. And the last thing I'll mention, and this is sort of, it's a little bit more than speculation at this point, but I think the movement has pretty much decided that we really need an in-person conference again, probably in 2024. And we really hope that we can design this so that we can just get many, many people out there from many sectors and really put on a show of force. Thank you. Uh, now, Maury, um, are we going to switch over to Lois or will it be Q&A now? Yep, Lois. Okay. Yeah, uh, Mary, Mary's muted, so she's saying something. Well, we want to hear from Lois before we go to the Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right with you, Sheila. Oh, here we go. Okay, I'm going to be very short. I say amen to what all the stuff that Sheila has said. Um, just to say that um, I, I co-chair uh, a national network uh, of the United Church of Canada on this issue. Um, it's been a stated policy of our church since uh, 1972, but you know we sent a resolution to Ottawa and nothing happened as usual. So now we're going to try to animate the membership and to get people active in their, in their particular area on this issue. Um, we've got a we've got a small network. It needs to be expanded, but it's it's active. Uh, we have contacts in every province. Um, one of the most effective things we did a year ago, we had visuals in front of the uh, MPs offices across the country, and personal lobbying of MPs. Um, now we're shifting our focus to 
aldermen and mayors locally as the action uh, seems to be now shifting to the cities. And that'll be much more uh, reachable for people to speak to their aldermen or their mayors to find out what's going on and lobby there. Um, our, we liaison with basic income and we also liaison with Senator Kim Pate in Ottawa, who has, um, as you know, a motion on the floor to um, activate the, the government on this one. It's going to be very difficult though, because Trudeau keeps saying he's all for the middle class. So our focus is, is on cities and on local action you can take. And um, I think that's probably all I'll say right now uh, except one more thing. I mean, I think the churches have been largely responsible for this Lady Bountiful handout scheme for the poor for so long. Uh, it's, it's a model that, uh, in my view, is not consistent with the gospel. But uh, we have had this other link also, which is more to do with justice for the poor. But it's not widely known, and we're working to get it widely known. Okay, back to you. Well, it's very difficult, but I think the first thing is to acknowledge it. So it's been picked up by the federal government, for example. I've heard a cabinet minister say, well, you know, the churches will look after the people in poverty. We don't have to do anything. Uh, and to shift that perspective to the guaranteed livable income, it's very slow work and uh, it's only one part of the puzzle, but that's what we can do. It's not going to happen overnight. I think it's important to acknowledge that this is not a silver bullet for poverty. It's one thing. It's one thing that can help immensely. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that a lot of people in the churches particularly ignore the media, which I think is a complete mistake, because mm -hmm. that's how most people get their information, different sources of media. And uh, we need to hone in on that. So we keep at it. It's one thing among many in terms of uh, eliminating poverty. And we need to acknowledge that. First of all, I really want to support Lois in, in what she was talking about, about the government keeping talking about the middle class. Like this just, my blood just boils every time I see this. We're helping the middle class and those who want to be part of it. And yeah. anybody who walks out on a street in this country can see middle class people who are going to food banks. Like yeah. people who used to be middle class. Our board has a couple of members on it of people who used to be middle class and then it disappeared, you know, because jobs dried up because of, you know, any number of things. And then you wait till 65 and then your life, you know, sort of gets back on track again. So this whole middle class fallacy is, is just crazy. Um, on the, the lady bountiful thing, I think, we had a really interesting conversation with somebody who was running community programs out of a church at one point and and they they, they just found the sense of community in their group and i think there were a, a number of single moms and different people who needed various supports who were you know coming to those groups and so we had a talk about what you can do in a similar kind of circumstance without depending on people being poor to do it. You can still do community building. You can still offer all kinds of supports to people. There is a need for community, but it's community amongst people and with people, not people are forced to come to you for community because they have nowhere else to go. So, and, and the, the same with, with food banks and some of them now are like furniture distribution centers. There's all kinds of things you can do with those locations and those ideas that supports people collectively that doesn't depend on people having to be there. The, oh, the, other, sorry, no. the other thing I want to mention is uh, the evidence of the pilot projects. I mean, I know that they were canceled early, 
but I thought the one, the evaluation of the Hamilton one under Wynne's government that went for some time and um, McMaster did an evaluation of, of it before it was canceled and it's all positive. It's all positive and people need to read those. And, and that's the evidence we've got so far. Yeah, and we, we did a survey. We ended up with a bigger database than anybody once the Ford government pulled everything away from the researchers. So yeah. we are not stats can or an academic institution, but we surveyed over 400 people. The only negative thing anybody had to say about anything was the cancellation. Like <laughs> everything about the program was positive. And, and the... What two things really amazed me, the range of things that people use their money for. No bureaucrat sitting in some office is ever going to be able to anticipate that. Like you have to let people run their own lives. And the second was how quickly people with mental health and physical health problems started turning around. Mm -hmm. Like we expected that, but the speed floored even us. Gosh. Yeah, like it's full of stories. I mean, one one woman said, "I can get my teeth fixed now." Like yeah. that's or, or in, in that one sentence is a whole pile of stuff. And we need to be able to tell those stories, which I think are more uh, telling than a lot of statistics. So Newfoundland and Labrador is a fascinating story because it goes way back not to the earliest days in the 70s when we were talking about this, but in, <clears throat> in the 80s and 90s, when times were getting tough economically, Newfoundland and Labrador was going through um, a process of economic renewal, EI was changing, the rules around fisheries were changing, there was a lot going on. In the midst of this, one of the things that the Newfoundland and Labrador government was actively trying to work with, um, work with the federal government on was a basic income. And the federal bureaucrats, our buddy and I believe, shut it down. This was during the Axworthy era. Um, I worked with Axworthy. My buddy Ron Heichel worked with Axworthy. We think if Axworthy really knew what was going on, he would not have supported what a lot of the officials were doing. But it's, it's the way bureaucracies work. So there's, it's, it's like a part of the story of the, you know, pilot story of trying to do something of lobbying for this that got lost for a while. And I've just rediscovered this and it's amazing. Um, and, and there are people in Newfoundland and Labrador who have written about it. More recently, however, what they have done largely, I think, around the auspices of the new health accord, Newfoundland and Labrador, have got a lot of community organizations together with government to really look at how we redesign the whole system. Not just we want money from the federal government to do a basic income, but what can Newfoundland and Labrador itself as a government, as communities do to help push this forward. So I to me, I think that's brilliant. Like there are, they are looking at what they can do. And it's similar to Ontario. The Ontario government was starting to look at what Ontario can do to move us forward. Um, but as John Abbott, the minister says, um, what they're getting from the federal government is what he calls radio silence. <laughs> yeah. And he, has, and he has stated that publicly. Like it's just radio silence. And now, and then we had the BC government looking at something. They focused on their own provincial jurisdiction, discovered they couldn't do it provincially. That should have come as no surprise to anybody. Provinces can't do it on their own. Like it needs to be a collaborative effort across governments. And as you mentioned, Lois, the, the focus on municipalities now I think is huge because they are bearing the brunt Yep. of all of the problems that are being downloaded and they are structured fiscally so yep. that they cannot manage it. They cannot. And do, you, they, do you have any information on how they got Victoria to declare itself 
in, in the city of Victoria wanting basic oh. Yeah, I'm not sure about the details, but I know that Roderick Benz, who's a journalist who works with us, he and his then partner, Jolie Scheidler Benz, did a survey of mayors in 2014, I think. Um, and he has published a number of these. Lisa Helps was the mayor then and is still the mayor now. And she was very supportive way back when. Hmm. So I think there are other local people in, in Victoria who got together and started putting a push on this again. And I believe they've gone from Victoria to a more regional municipal collective that they're pushing as well. So we've got Fredericton, we've got Kingston. There are lots of cities. Another recent one is um, St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. So mm -hmm. they were on the verge, the deputy mayor was pushing this. She had a couple of people who were really pushing against it and a number of skeptics. And we tinkered around with some language because this used to be my job as a UN negotiator. It's like, you know, past lives come in handy occasionally. We tinkered around with a few words and it was, it was a few words that had meanings for people that disturbed them. And it wasn't the concept, it was this like, this means something to me that I don't like. So we changed a few words and she got what she didn't believe was possible, which was unanimous support. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So there's lots of work to be done. Um, I love to see work to be done in the Halifax, the mayor is really on board as well, which is great. A lot of work being done in the Atlantic. It needs Toronto. Mm -hmm. Toronto mayor talks, the feds listen. I think it's like the churches, unless somebody picks it up, nothing's going to happen. But you're quite right, that was their policy decision. Yeah, if I can offer, I think it's similar with the NDP. There are things on the policy, well, on all, for all parties. Um, there are things on the policy books that don't become priorities for the leadership. Um, yeah. And in this case, um, like I'm not a politician, I'm not tied to political, like I'm nonpartisan, but um, what, what appears to be the case uh, within the liberal government is that Carla Qualtro has the full backing of the prime minister for disability benefit. Um, Minister Duclos, for sure, and Minister Gould, I believe, um, are both in, in uh, Duclos with health and Gould with children, families, social development, whatever that department's now called, goes through so many names. Um, I think they are very supportive, but they do not have the blessing of their leader or their finance minister. So there's not much they can do. So I think within all parties, um, there is support for this. In the conservative party, it tends to be younger people, which is interesting, but a lot of younger people are also going ultra conservatively, which is that whole right wing phenomenon so one of the answers to your question, Bill, I think is that the rise of the more extremist conservative things may make some of the liberal and NDP people go to their policy books to look for things that are going to appeal to an electorate that they need to reach. And this is one of them, I would hope. Lois, would you like to comment? Well, I was just wondering if we might look at some coordinated uh, approach to Freeland. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think she runs the Liberal government. <laughs> and I'd like to know what she thinks about this, but I, I don't think she could respond to only the United Church, but we had a coalition of groups of people representing different viewpoints that went to her. I think it would be very useful. I don't think the rich would move out. There's too much for them in the cities. That's why they are there in the first place. Yeah. 
I think, I think, I think that's a theoretical question, but I, I really can't think it's realistic. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so either, because again, what you're if you fund this property through properly through a wide, um, largely federal tax base, oh. you're really spreading that out, and it actually offers the municipalities the capacity to do more with the revenue they collect. Um, municipalities do have choices about those things and they can decide to increase property taxes and that sort of thing but that's a separate it's a separate kind of thing i actually think i mean a lot the cities are based on their livability and when you have a city that's starting to deteriorate as people are describing toronto lately um that really doesn't attract anybody yeah Okay, that's that gets technical. Um, I would ask people because I, I won't be able to explain it as well here. In BICN's policy options document, and we've tried to, you know, explain this in as simple terms as possible for people, um, because it does get very technical. There's lots of charts, but there's like a four page intro that basically describes it. What we did in order to find sources to fund the basic income was look at look at a range of things from redesigning programs. So there's money already in the system. There are things that are going out, GST credits, um, social assistance payments. There's income flowing to people in disconnected ways with different criteria and whatever. So you amalgamate all of those things to make things work better. Then you look at redesigning other programs that maybe have conditions and pull some of the resources in from there to be able to fund the basic income. Much of what we did was simply based on tax fairness. Um, there are like it's staggering the billions of dollars that go out to really, really wealthy people and corporations because we tax them differently and more leniently. And that's crazy. Like we didn't used to do that. We shouldn't be doing it now. And then the last thing that we couldn't model, but that we know is there. And that's the cost of what we're doing now. Yeah. So we're paying enormous amounts of money for, you know, hospital emergency beds for people who should never have to end up in hospital, um, for prolonged cancer and other illness treatments, because people are suffering not from the disease or lack of health care, but because of poverty and the fact that they can't eat and be housed properly. Like the, the, the money that's flowing out for all of these anti-poverty programs comes back in if you don't have poverty. So the, the, the net cost actually works out in, in our favor. You know, we, we actually could recoup some costs and even if we don't, even if it is just break even, you have people living much healthier lives. You have communities that work together better. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And it's why you really have to develop your basic income policy based on your own country context. So in the United States, the one might argue you would need a higher level of income because you'd have to cover exorbitant health care insurance costs out of that. For example, um, in Europe, your basic income might be lower because the level of public service that's available to people is better. Um, the housing thing in Canada is, is just insane. I mean, that, that can only be tackled in, in both ways, like the demand side and the supply side. We need more affordable housing. Nobody's building it. They can't afford to build it because you've got a whole bunch of people who can't afford to pay much of anything. 
-hmm. So you have a vicious circle going on there. If there was more affordable housing and if people had a little bit more income and secure income, like nobody's going to look into, you know, buying a house and setting a mortgage up if, if they have no idea how long their job's going to last. So, you know, the security really matters too for most people. And I think it, it just has to be a combination of these things, understanding how they all work together, not in silos. I think there are, see, I, should, I should know this better. I'm immersed in federal policy and I don't, I admit I don't understand political and municipal quite so well, but I think there are municipal level policies that, that do that in Canada too. I'm not sure whether it's mean that, that actually provide for a certain percentage of new housing development to be affordable. We, we should be aware also that, the, that many churches are getting affordable housing as their sanctuaries become obsolete. Uh, St. Luke's United in uh, Toronto here are well along in there. They've got the municipal okay and so on. And St. Matthew's is not nearly as far advanced, but we should be aware that the, the, you know, the, the movement for affordable housing is, is alive in the churches as they look for new ways to make their property useful. So I just really want to say thank you both Sheila and Lois for all of your time today. And um, it, I think we had a really good discussion and I'm sorry we didn't have a bigger turnout, but that's something we'll work on for next time. I find this idea super inspiring. And I, I mean, we managed universal health care almost a hundred years ago. Right now there's some talk about universal dentistry, which is long overdue. So I feel like this idea it hasn't had its time yet, but its time is coming. And I really hope that's some time that we will all see. Yep. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Lois. Okay. Keep up your good work. <laughs>